Who do we sell our products to? Government. To government. That is a very, very good answer. And I want to tell you that we do not do business with government, and we try not to. And I'm so thankful for that. But that's very, very interesting. Very interesting that you would start with government. Thank you, Tisa. And uh, a few observations before I start is that either you're expecting a lot of your friends to come sit right up at the front, or you're afraid of me, or I can't think of the other options. Why, why don't you all just come a whole lot closer and enjoy the experience and coziness? of enjoying mm -hmm. closer company unless you really have a reason for sitting in your seat i will tell you that for me as a speaker there's a glare from the pavement over there with the sun reflecting so it's actually easier to see the faces in front than at the back and i was expecting around about 40 people so either I was misinformed or the topic is not exciting or back to what you said, there's an issue around spirituality, respect, training in righteousness and godliness and whatever else if we want to link that to being punctual. But we're preaching to the choir because you are here and that's a wonderful, wonderful thing. I'm so pleased that you are here and I'm pleased to be able to address you. I want to change, if I may, one of the house rules. Um, I was a little bit uncomfortable with, with you being given pieces of paper to write down questions for later. Firstly, you should bring your own piece of paper. You're responsible for your own plan. Secondly, you should know why you're here and you're free to ask questions anytime. Preferably not in mid-sentence, but I'm pretty comfortable and relaxed with any time. So if it's relevant and it's really burning your heart and you think I've been talking about this subject for a few minutes, you're very, very welcome to clarify because sometimes understanding helps us hang the rest of the discussion on. And I recognize that. So feel very free. So I was very surprised that very few of you seem to know the reason why we're here today. What is the, what is the subject for today? And I'd, I'd like you not to answer. I'd like somebody from over here to answer. I really can't hear you because you're very, very shy or you haven't learned to project your voice or I'm getting old. Is that what you all thought you'd hear today? So are you here because somebody told you to be here or are you here because you're excited about the subject? Excited. That's so cool. Okay. And we're going to talk much more than what you think is behind that title. I'm going to take you through quite a lot of stuff. So what are your expectations from today? What are you hoping to get from the time that you've invested? You, as young people, are investing time listening to me, who is much older, much closer to the grave. Why are you investing this time? Why are you here? What are you expecting to get from this discussion? I'd love to hear some of your thoughts. That's a tricky expectation <laughs> to put on me after I've heard you've had some good speakers. And I don't know what they've told you. So that's very tricky for me. Yeah? Uh, so as an, um, uh, as an agriculture student, uh, I guess I'd like to hear some of your recommendations of the different opportunities that are out there. Good. What opportunities do you think are out there? What, do you think, what vocations do you think there are in agriculture? I think there's, there's a good opportunity in supplying of inputs. Um, you know, there's an opportunity in different niche markets. So things that are not done on wider scale, like yeah, so, so, yeah, so like maize or cabbage, you know, you can go into a niche market and maybe selling radishes if there is a market for such things. You know. Selling crops? Uh, yeah. Are you talking about the growing of the crops or the selling of the crops? Uh, both. Both, yeah. I mean, okay. <laughs> yeah. 
English might get good before. Don't laugh because I'm coming to you next. <laughs> So the growing of, of crops which are niche, that's a nice word. Does everyone know what niche means? I actually looked it up on Google this morning, funny enough. Amazing cones. What does niche mean? Small market. Good. So niche is a very specific opportunity. And uh, all of the things that you've said. Okay, cool. So, so we're talking about growing niche crops and we're also talking about selling niche crops. Hmm, Okay. That's it. Any other opportunities in agriculture? Or do we think growing of niche crops, selling of niche crops, and supplying inputs, those are the vocational opportunities in agriculture? Is that what we think? Computers or finances? How does that relate to agriculture? <laughs> That's excellent. You're well prepared. <laughs> but seriously, how can IT, how can computers, how can finance be related to agriculture? Yeah? Good. Art can be digitalized. Very good. Do you know that tractors can drive themselves? Did you know that tractors can drive themselves? They don't need a driver. Very good. I'm glad that's new because I'm here to stretch you, challenge you, get outside the box. So your point led to an important piece of information is that we're at the stage now where I can on my phone get my tractor started up from my phone and I can send it down the field, give it its area to drive, and it'll take off and it'll do the job without a driver. Cool. Okay, cool. So, some expectations. We're wanting to understand what are some of the vocational opportunities. What other expectations are we, am I getting from this group? Really just focused on agriculture. How many of you are agricultural students? Okay, so there's quite a few who are not involved in agriculture. I hope you're not wasting your time here today. You absolutely aren't, because I certainly will be talking about much more than just agriculture. Excellent. The challenge we have in Zambia, one of the challenges we have is that there are two types of people in Zambia, I've learned. There are those who are farmers, and there's those who want to be farmers. And it seems like often nobody else exists. And I really, really try and challenge that understanding as often as I can. Because people say agriculture is about me going and farming. And that farming picture starts with growing maize. And really, folk, that is the challenge that we want to address, is to break that out and, and get into a much bigger picture. And I'm really happy that I've already heard some really good feedback from you. So a little bit about my background. Uh, in this particular instance, I represent precision farming. And we have three legs of a pot. Very unusual is precision farming. And I hope that from that background, I'm going to challenge you to think differently, to be different, to get outside the box that you are in. All of us are in a box. Try and get outside of that box. So we have three legs. The first leg is agricultural inputs. And I was really happy that that was picked up as one of the starting points. I have been to all corners of Zambia. I know farmers, the majority of the large-scale commercial farmers, I know from Livingston to Mbala, I've been on their farms, I know where they live, and I've addressed many small-scale farmers. And when I've finished telling them what I know, or a little piece of what I know, they cannot believe that I do not own a farm. And they're really shocked when I tell them I never ever want to be a farmer, and thank you Lord that I'm not a farmer. <laughs> but I love being in agriculture, and I love working with farmers. And so I want to challenge any perception you've got that farming, agriculture, is about being on a farm with a hoe producing maize. Because unfortunately, that is a perspective that a lot of people in Zambia have. 
So these three legs, the first leg is that we supply inputs to farmers, and it's a wide range of inputs. The second leg is we supply into the transport industry, filtration parts. The third leg is FMCG. Anybody know what FMCG stands for? FMCG. FMCG, listen out for it, you will hear it. FMCG stands for Fast Moving Consumer Goods. It's the shop rights, it's the pick and pays, it's the choppies, it's the person selling stuff on the corner where he's got to restock and he's got to make sure he's got enough groceries in his store and it is fast moving consumer goods. It's a fast paced experience and uh, I actually did some of that in my background. So, our three legs, first of all, agricultural inputs. We do agricultural chemicals, fungicides, herbicides, insecticides. We do biological products, fungi and bacteria, nice soft green biological products that help plants grow better. They target pests. We deal with nutrition. We deal with granular fertilizer. Can anybody give me an example of a granular fertilizer? A common granular fertilizer in Zambia. You need to be widely read. I'm going to encourage you to read widely, understand things that are outside of your subject of reference because you never know when there's a connection. You will probably kick yourselves when I give you an example of a granular fertilizer that is talked about in Zambia very often. Has anybody heard such a thing as compound D? That is a granular fertilizer. Some farmers think that that's the only input they ever need, which is a tragedy. Anybody heard of urea? That's a granular fertilizer. So we do granular fertilizers at Precision Farming, but we try not to do very much of them. You know why? Because everybody is in that space and the margins are very low. And it's a very stealable commodity and it's very hard to manage. And we'd rather let other people do that space. But for specific farming clients who want very specific basal recommendations, we look after them and we supply them. So we do basal fertilizer. We do soluble fertilizers. Soluble fertilizers, what are those? They're much higher cost. So if you take compound D, soluble fertilizers will be two and three times the price. But they're soluble in water, which means you can put them through dripper irrigation systems into high value crops. Tomatoes, what is one of the most exciting just being exported crops from Zambia in the last two years? You should be reading out there. You should be watching what's happening out there because this is economics, this is business. This is agriculture. It's Zambia getting into a whole new space. Can anybody think of the two crops I'm thinking of? Just two of the many that we've started exporting from Zambia. Guys, you need to get out there and read. Has anybody heard of blueberries? You haven't heard of blueberries? Do you know that those are very, very sought after as as a health food and Zambia is now exporting those and I want to tell you that in Johannesburg a kg of blueberries is selling for I think the last price I checked was 20 about 21 dollars three times the price I can buy it in Lusaka 21 dollars into kwacha times by 18 times by 17 for one kilo of blueberries we are growing them in Zambia and we are sending them out of the country. We're sending them by air and we're sending them to truck all the way to Cape Town. How far away is Cape Town? How many kilometers? Anybody have any idea? 2,500, 2,800 kilometers. A long way from here by truck to be put on a ship to be sent offshore. Guys, that's exciting for Zambia. Blueberries. Avocados. Do you know that Zambia recently announced from one of our lovely farmers in Makushi that we're exporting avocados? Yes. Do you know where we're exporting them to? Yes. To? Yes. She's been reading or listening. <laughs> it's exciting. It's exciting. So, let me get back to the topic. If I get too long-winded, put up your hand and start waving and saying, move on. Move on, you know? You know the taxi guys, move on. So soluble fertilizers into these high-value crops, we can mix them in water and put them through the drippers. Okay, so that's 
the soluble fertilizers. Then we do things like other nutrients, foliars that you spray onto the plant that absorb through the leaf of the plant. What else do we do? We do T-Jet nozzles. These are tiny little plastic nozzles that are put onto a boom sprayer. Does everybody know what a boom sprayer is? A boom sprayer with a big water tank is what applies the chemicals to the, to the crops. So if you've got a, an insecticide, you need to spray it across the whole crop. You have a boom sprayer. The most common size in Zambia is 24 meters. Sorry, is 24 meters? Yes, 48 nozzles. Is 24 meters of boom sprayer with piping that the tractor with a pump pushes out spray onto the crop to put the fungicide, the nutrition, whatever it is, onto the crop. These little plastic nozzles, which you haven't even thought exist, cost about they're ten dollars a unit, ten dollars times eighteen. Is that two hundred kwacha roughly? For one little nozzle, there's forty-eight of them on the average size boom in Zambia. Farmers would spend that twice a year to make sure that they're getting the expensive chemical onto the much more valuable crop to protect it. Did you know that space existed? Did you know that precision farming has become the go-to for nozzle technology in Zambia? And we supply a product called T-Jet, which comes out of Chicago. They're the biggest manufacturer of nozzles in the world. And that T-Jet is a brand name amongst the many brands that we have, because we built our business on brand names, that we've become the go-to. If somebody wants to know what volume to apply and how to apply, they come and get the nozzles from us. And you know that we don't make a lot of money from those nozzles. Why on earth would we be involved in that space? Because it's unique, farmers come and talk to us. And when they talk to us, we talk to them. And the next thing, we've got a relationship. And the next thing, we're supplying other inputs other than the nozzles. Because the relationship counts. And I'm going to be talking to you about relationship just now. So, we do other things in our agricultural space. But that's the one leg. The second leg, which is quite a small one, is supplying filtration products to transporters. Big transporters, uh, bus companies will supply the air filters, the oil filters, the coolant. Does anybody know what coolant is? Your engine in your car gets very hot. So you put water in there. Do not put Lusaka water in your radiator because it has lime in it. You've seen that white lime in the kettle. And it blocks up inside your engine and it reduces the cooling temperature and capacity of your engine and eventually you will damage your engine. Collect rainwater or put coolant in it. Coolant looks after your engine. There's a little bit of advertising, but I'm hoping I'm going to save your engine and maybe you'll get another 100,000 kilometers out of your engine. We do those fleet guard filters for transporters, a very different customer base. The last leg is our FMCG. So we import wines from South Africa together with uh, what we call mixers, little cans of uh, soda water, uh, ginger ale, lemonade, uh, tonic water, these kind of things. Uh, a nice one for students actually is uh, the cheeky cranberry because it's got a good caffeine kick. It's a bit like a Red Bull. The range is called Fitch and Leeds. We import that into Zambia. And we have a customer base from individuals right through to all of the supermarkets and so forth. So we've got three legs to a very interesting pot. So when you talk to me about agriculture, agriculture for me is very limiting. There's a lot more out there. Here's a question to you. Why would precision farming have these three different legs rather than sticking and focusing to agri on, on agriculture? It's a very specific strategy. It's been opportunistic, but a very specific strategy. Why on earth would we not just focus on agriculture? We're so busy. We could just focus on agriculture, why don't we? I'm glad I'm here today, because I'm certainly going to challenge your thinking. I can see the cogs are turning in some instances. Maybe some have switched off, I'm not sure. <laughs> Do you remember March 2020? What happened? Ah, ah, very interesting. That taught us a lot of shocks. It taught us a lot of shock, shock, shocking stuff and gave us a lot of shocks. The first thing that happened is our whole wine business died the next day. Because all of the restaurants closed, all of the hotels, no more people in the hotels. Another big shock we had is 
We always thought exports were great for Zambia because it's foreign currency, you're always going to get paid. That was the first part of the agricultural industry that stopped dead in the water. I remember the day that one of our blueberry growers phoned. They actually do cut flowers offshore. They said, Ken, we've got a problem. We don't know when we're going to be able to pay you because our European market for cut flowers has died. Dead. Stopped. Nothing. And there's no flights out because all the flights stopped. Guys, how could I have ever foreseen that? How could our management team ever have foreseen that? We had never experienced that in our lives, nor in the history. It wasn't like we had missed out on a history lesson somewhere. Thank the Lord. Thank the Lord for agriculture. For four weeks, we had a nightmare because Sadak shut down all the borders and then said, well, no, we can't because we've got to get something moving. What did they have to get moving? Yes, food. They had to get food moving. Agriculture is a priority industry in a time of crisis. Thank you, Lord. Otherwise, I might not be standing here today because within four weeks, we got trucks moving across the border and we were back in business. Very shortly after that, the transport business picked up again because transporters are needed to move essential goods around, so they needed filters. But the beverage business, dead in the water. Thank you, Lord, that we were not based only there, not in tourism, not in anything else. So guys, having three legs is diversity. Diversity of risk. And we diversify risk in many, many ways. Now, we live in Africa. It's a risky space. But I want to tell you that Zambia is a paradise. And I say, thank you, Lord, that I'm in Zambia. I wouldn't want to be anywhere else because there are great opportunities here. I promise you, I say that to people regularly. Thank you, Lord, for putting me in Zambia. When COVID came along, thank you, Lord, that I'm in Zambia. When COVID came along, thank you, Lord, that I'm in agriculture in Zambia. And so... I'm giving you a few interesting thoughts because it's pretty hard to decide what am I going to do when I leave uni or when I'm finished my studies. And you can't prepare for any eventuality, but there are things that you can do to prepare for some of those eventualities. We have a diversity of our customer base. You can't imagine, you cannot conceive the diversity of our customer base. In the agricultural sector, we've got a customer base that's diverse. Do you know who our customers are in the agricultural space? There's three key categories. Any suggestions, thoughts? Who do we sell our products to? Government. To government. That is a very, very good answer. And I want to tell you that we do not do business with government, and we try not to. And I'm so thankful for that. But that's very, very interesting. Very interesting that you would start with government, who's the very last on my list. If I had to go to government, it would be because I've got no other option, and I'm desperate. Good. I like that. I really like that. So government is not our customer and we don't want them to be. Government should be in business. That's not government's role as a matter of interest. That's not the reason why we don't want to do business with them. Who are our customers? Very good. Large scale. Are we, I use yeah, interchange, large scale and commercial. Uh, very good. Commercial farmers. I wonder why we use that word commercial. That's good. Commercial farmers. Very good. Direct to the farmer. You're sitting very quietly, ladies. Especially the two with the longer hair. <laughs> Any suggestions? Who might our customers be? Come, think outside the box. Government, commercial farmers, yeah? Supermarkets. Very interesting question. Very interesting, well, it's not a question, it's a statement. So supermarkets... Generally, people don't go to supermarkets to buy their agricultural inputs. They might buy a little bit of fertilizer there, but they're not going to generally buy their herbicide from a supermarket. Where might they buy them from? Agro dealers in Zambia. Good. Okay, super. Agro dealers. Yes, we deal with agro dealers. We deal with commercial farmers. We deal with agro dealers. We have small-scale small farmers who walk through the door and will buy one liter. They pay cash. They're very different to the commercial farmer because the commercial farmer might be a thousand liters. He might be one pickup load of goods and he might want credit. There's another level of customer, which are the estates in Zambia. I don't know if you know about the estates, but they do thousands of hectares. And we sometimes have a whole truck, a 30 ton truck going to one or two farmers of that size. And on a truck, 
$100,000 times 17. So 1.8 million, 1.7 million quacha on a truck. I'm not talking fertilizer. I'm talking about chemicals, adjuvants, all the other high value items, which we love to be in. Going to one of those farms, a very different customer to the large scale commercial and the small scale or the agro dealer. A diversity of customers. But let me tell you, the small scale customer walking through the door paying cash is very important to us because they're paying cash. But they require a lot of attention for only one liter. And I'm only going to make 20 quach on that liter or you're going to make 20 quach on that liter. Whereas on that truckload that's worth 1.7 million, you're going to make a lot more money. So you can afford to pay a lot more attention to get that business. Does that make sense? A diversity of a customer base. And you think that that's interesting? Well, in addition to that, we deal with corporates who are not farming themselves. So we will deal with a corporate company that is supplying small scale farmers. We'll deal with them. We'll also sell, do you know who we get really excited about selling to? Our competitors. <laughs> Beautiful. I love it. I love it when I'm getting a response from you because it tells me you're listening and you're getting something new. Let me tell you, we are at the stage as precision farming where we're blessed that we no, don't necessarily want any more direct farmers on our books. Because we've got such a great base of customers, we can't look after all of them properly. And if you just keep adding customers, remembering that we don't just sell product, we want to give a service behind that product. And that's a very important understanding. That if we have too many and stretch ourselves too thin, we will lose those same customers that we started with. And so there comes a point also where there's customers that we don't want to do business with because they're a credit risk, they don't look after their credit well, or they've got a specific relationship with one of our competitors, we say, Amen, leave them there. Let's rather supply our competitor with a really good brand product. So what we've done is been able to have brands that we've only got access to. That is such good chemistry, such good products that those people will want it by name and we can supply it to our competitors. I love it when our competitors come and buy product from us. And I will tell you that we buy from them. Zambia is at the end of a long logistics chain. When we get hit with a particular crisis, suddenly that particular chemical that can fix that crisis will be finished. We will move amongst ourselves because before we can get stock into the country, we will source stock from other competitors to be able to supply our farmer. Here's a little bit of insight into our industry. What are we doing? We're looking after the customer all the way along, getting solutions for them as quickly as possible. And I want that to be a part of what you see as important in no matter what you do, is that relationship with the customer. And you keep listening out for the words relationship, customer, service, listen out for those things because they are so critical if you're gonna be successful in what you do. And don't think about it just as a company, think about it as an individual. You may be a standalone person, you may be an individual with your own business, you may be working in a company that has customers. Listen to these principles, they all apply in the same way. I hope so far you're getting a feeling that there's a lot more opportunity in agriculture than you may first have thought as we dig and look at the little niche things and the opportunities. There are two main sources of primary wealth in Zambia. Can you tell me what those two main sources of primary wealth are in Zambia? Ladies, I hope I'm going to get an answer from one of you before the end of today, not to feel any pressure. You guys are all having a nice little chill on the back uh, bench there as well. I'm happy to hear an answer from you. Don't look behind you, but I mean, you can look behind you, any of you. You're very welcome to contribute to the discussion. And those right in front of the hedge at the back, what are the two primary sources of wealth in Zambia? Okay, very interesting. Entrepreneurship as a source, a primary source of wealth. Okay, let's put that out there for the moment. Yeah. Very good. Mining is the first one. Agriculture is the second one. Entrepreneurship is the oil by which these operate, ultimately. And so you're absolutely right. The only two sources of wealth is mining, taking something from the ground, and agriculture is also, in a sense, harvesting from the ground. 
And these are the two biggest drivers of the economy, actually. But we're very reliant on the mining, and Zambia needs to change that. All other economic goods and services pretty much revolve around those two, those two drivers, if you think about it, ultimately. And so we know agriculture is a focus of this government. It's a good place to be. Zambia needs agriculture to be successful. Now here's a question for you. This is to make those at the back who might be sleeping wake up a little bit. Everybody's looking over their shoulders. Nobody behind me, fortunately. Do we need 4 million subsistence farmers in Zambia? And do we want to increase that number? <coughs> to be fair, my presentation time is dictated by how long you take to answer the questions. <laughs> So if you're sitting here at 1,700 hours, it's not my fault. But I'm glad you're taking time to think about it. Come on. Take a risk. Give a thought. Put it out there. I think I'd say no. Okay. Why? Um, everyone will be growing the same thing and supplying each other. So what, what's the point? <laughs> Okay, good thinking. There's a key word in the question I asked. Do we need 4 million subsistence farmers in Zambia? Or 5 million? What does subsistence mean? Right. So here's a thought. Instead of having 4 million subsistence farmers, why don't we have 1 million successful 20 to 200 hectare farmers, middle income farmers that are successfully generating a surplus of income that they need to spend in the community. They need a Hilux, they need a tractor, they need a mechanic to come and fix that, they need somebody to come and put their borehole down, they need somebody to transport their grain to the market, they need somebody else to come and give them agricultural advice, an agronomist, a consultant, to come and get their blueberries growing? Can you imagine if the other 3 million are gainfully employed because the economy is stimulated by 1 million successful farmers that are pushing money into the economy through generating very successful entrepreneurial processes? Does that make sense? You will hear so much about help the, help the subsistence farmers. And I say carefully, we need successful middle and large-scale farmers to employ those little subsistence farmers that are going to fall behind and let them be employed in a safe space where they get a good income and let the land be well used and let the economy get up and run and let people be fed because now suddenly we've got a farmer who can switch into other crops. They can put money aside and they can grow macadamias. Do you know that we're having a revolution in this country of farmers planting macadamias, which take three years to start yielding? How many subsistence farmers can afford to wait three years for the crop? But that commercial farmer and that medium-scale farmer, they can. They can put one hectare in this year and another hectare next year from the savings from their crop. That's what we need, because when we start exporting macadamias, we need harvesters, we need transporters, we're going to get foreign currency coming in that is not dependent on mining. And that is exciting. So does Zambia need 4 million subsistence farmers? We rather need to create an economy that is vibrant. And I hope each one of you are going to be a key part of that vibrancy and probably not as the farmer. The question, young people, is are you employable? Are you employable in that opportunity and that space that we hope Zambia is heading towards? Because it's not just about the economy, it's about you, and you have a chance to be different. You have a chance to pick up that niche opportunity as Precision has, 
had that opportunity and thank the Lord for his blessing and those opportunities. But you've got to go and find that opportunity and run with it. Are you employable? Does anybody know what Micah 6 verse 8 says? That's a tough one. He has told you, O man, what is good and what does the Lord require of you? You remember that verse? What does the Lord require of you? To do justice, to love kindness or mercy, and to walk humbly with your God. So there's a do, there's a love, there's a walk. For me, the doing is being involved. For me, the loving is, is what you do with your relationships around you. And the walking, the walking is the journey. The doing is justice, doing what is right around you. The loving kindness is that beauty of relationship of considering others before yourself. Servant leadership is a beautiful thing that I believe our president at last is talking about and I believe is showing. And it's so exciting. We need servant leaders in Africa and we need you to be a servant leader. Love, kindness. And then on the journey, walk with what attitude? Humbly with your God. Young people, this is where it starts. I'm going to talk about investing. Firstly, investing in a healthy lifestyle. Secondly, investing wisely in yourself. Thirdly, investing wisely in assets. I talk in threes, so it should be very easy because under each of these, there's going to be three points. Under the healthy lifestyle, we're going to be talking about healthy relationships. We're going to be talking about healthy spiritual life. We're going to be talking about healthy physical life. And under each of those, there will be three points. Make it very easy for you. Healthy relationships. I'm telling you, your success starts with healthy relationships. And there's three key relationships I'm going to talk about. The first one is your relationship with God. The creator of heaven and earth, the savior of the world, the Lord Jesus Christ, who made you and knows how you function. He is your ultimate source of life, firstly. Of wisdom. And listen to me of character and integrity and i'm telling you character and integrity is very desirable in the people we employ and in the people we do business with precision farming cannot stand alone it has a whole lot of stakeholders that must do their job exceptionally well at our standards for precision to be able to do what we do well our bankers our clearing agents our suppliers we look for character and integrity. We don't need legal agreements to keep them performing well or us to perform our role. We need character and integrity. And 90% of our business, there is no contractual agreement. It's built on relationship, knowing somebody, trusting them. I want to tell you guys, Precision Farming owes a lot of money to our suppliers. But I also want to tell you that we are owed much more money by our customers. And I'm telling you that that process requires a lot of trust and integrity with all the people involved. You be a person of character and integrity. And I want to tell you, when precision farming is employing and recruiting, the first thing we try and identify is character and integrity. We will even take somebody who doesn't look like they fit the job and squeeze them into the role if necessary because we're convinced of their character and their integrity. What does integrity mean? Are you scratching your ear? I know you were scratching your ear, but answer. What is integrity? <laughs> to do the right thing. To be honest. To be transparent. Character and integrity. So your relationship with God will govern this and you will get your wisdom from God. You really will. I have seen in the life of precision how the Lord has brought opportunities and wisdom in places that I couldn't have expected. Trust me. Invest in your relationship with the Lord. Secondly, family and friends. The company that you keep is very, very important because it impacts on how you view yourself and how you view the world around you. Connect with wise people. It might be your grandmother who's irritating because of her 
whatever she does. It might be the pastor who goes on and on about something that you really know is not relevant. It might be, it doesn't matter who it is, but if you know in your heart that that person is wise and godly, make sure you stay connected to them because you never know when they need you or you need them because it's not just a selfish thing of needing them all the time. Remember servant leadership. The third relationship that's really important is colleagues, what we call networking. Networking and staying in touch with people is very important. It really is not. It can sound selfish. But as a believer, turn that selfishness into servant leadership. That if you stay connected with somebody and then you hear they're going through a hard time, just connect with them, be there to support them. But at the same time, that networking is an opportunity to stay in contact in case you need something. A reference, an encouraging word, some wisdom, a loan of money, if that really has to happen. Whatever, just stay connected. They might know a position that comes available in a company and you've been looking for a position like that and they can link you up. Does anybody here keep their contacts? Meaning the first name, surname, phone number and email address of other people. Who does that here? Quite a few of you are doing it. What platforms are you using to keep contact details? Okay, so, so you're not using a digital platform to keep those contact details. You're keeping business cards and a diary. Okay, so you've got some there, some there, some there. Okay. Google Contact. Let me tell you, that's one of the biggest revolutions, I believe, for my life. I now have over 6,000 contacts. And I'm pretty pedantic about having the first name, the surname, the probably the position or the company, the phone number, the email address, and notes with dates of significant stuff. I don't always get it right, but let me tell you, I can go back to 2013 and pick up stuff about somebody. And I want to tell you that I've had people come through the office door and I can't remember them. <laughs> but they give me their name and I tap it into my Google contacts and Gmail remembers exactly who they were. Guys, there's two things I want you to take from this. Is firstly the value of building up your network. Just staying, even if it's just a note. You may never use that contact, but it costs you nothing to keep it on Google Contacts. The second thing is, is guard your reputation. Guard your reputation because Zambia is tiny. And the chances of your reputation, which you build up over years, getting out there can be destroyed in one second. Guard your reputation. So networking is important because information are like tree roots. Imagine you're the tree with one root. First of all, you're very unstable. Second of all, you can't get all the nutrients from around you. You need contacts like roots to go out, to be over there, to pick up the zinc and the copper over there or whatever nutrients it is that you need. And when you've got a wide network of roots, you will be more stable as an individual in many ways that you can't understand. Make sure you're networking with good people and even with the people out there who may not seem good to you. Connect, network, get information. You might hear about a job, an opportunity, a product that's needed. Seven different people have said they can't get this product and you step into the gap and you start supplying it. Support others around you. If you're in a workplace or at uni studying, support your colleagues, build up a network amongst yourselves. As it is, you should know each other and you should stay in touch with each other because you never know how you can help each other. And at least you know each other's character. Hey, I know there's a role here that that person would be absolutely spot on for. But I've lost their contact details because I lost my phone. Back it up. You don't have to have a forceful backup. You have a Google contacts. It's on every computer that you ever log into. It's there on the cloud. Make sure it's there for you. And opportunities. Opportunities come through other people. Relationships of colleagues. You're thinking colleagues next to you. I'm thinking, what about the guy who makes the coffee in the office? What about the guy who sweeps in the street? Make friends with those guys. You never know when they're going to watch your bicycle or your car. You never know when they're going to be a witness to say, this guy didn't do it. I know because I know him. Somebody below you, two below you, connect with them. 
See them. They're part of God's creation. They're part of the people of God. Connect with them. Your boss. Are you listening carefully? Learn to manage your boss. Anybody ever said that to you? Learn to manage your boss. I've got staff who can get anything they want out of me. Because they know how I operate. And I say anything they want with, with limits. Know when your boss is going to be in their happy space. Know what your boss needs to feel your support. So if I know from a team member I need them to be on time in all their meetings, all they have to do is fix that space and be on time. And other things can be negotiated. When I'm, in, when I'm tense because there's a financial challenge or there's a problem with a customer, don't, don't come and talk to me and start asking favors from me. Wait for that moment when it's resolved and it's sorted and we say, yes, guys, we're back on track. Yes, that's the moment to come and talk to me. Am I giving you some thoughts? Managing your boss is about letting your boss build up trust in you, knowing he can rely on you, that you will support him or her for all that they need you to do. Build that trust and then be okay to take risks. Excuse me, I, I really need to sit down with you. This is how I'm feeling. I'm really frustrated with the way you speak to me. Take that risk and see what your boss does. Say, I'm really sad because I feel hurt. I feel like you, you're saying X to me and, and this is what it means to me. When you talk about your feelings, nobody can argue with you because they're your feelings. I'm not attacking facts. I'm not saying you are a bad boss. I'm saying I really feel bad the way you spoke to me in public. Have that discussion. Take a bit of risk. Build relationship with your boss. I don't know what your boss looks like. Your boss may not respond to that. I am saying get to know your boss. And if you're clever, you can manage your boss. Have you taken that on board? I'm giving you space to think outside the box and do something different. Because if you manage your boss well, that tells me that you've learned about relationships. We've talked about investing in healthy relationships. Firstly, God, then your colleagues and your family, sorry, then your family and friends and then your colleagues. Secondly, get a healthy spiritual life. Spend time with the Lord, spend time in His Word, and spend time locked into His people, the church. That doesn't mean going to church on Sundays. It means being locked into his people. The church is not a building, it's a people. If you spend time in these three spaces, you will not go wrong. With God, with his word, with his people. Lastly, a healthy physical life. Guys, I'd be surprised if this is not going to bring some smiles to you. But this is important. You need to exercise at least three times a week, ladies. <laughs> exercise is not something for the guys, only. Three times a week, and that exercise needs to be for a minimum of 15 minutes, ideally 20 minutes or more. What does exercise mean? Exercise means I must be panting, <sighs> and I must be dripping with sweat. If I'm not panting and dripping with sweat, I'm not exercising sufficiently. Why on earth would I do that three times a week for 15 minutes? Good question. And two and three days later, when you feel stiff in your muscles and you think, what on earth did I do that for? Convert that into good things. That pain is good for me. My body has done wonderful things and I'm thriving on this exercise. Guys, your body thrives on exercise. That panting, that sweating is very, very good for you. It builds up your lung capacity. It builds up your oxygen capacity. It will help you if you get COVID or flu because you've got a higher capacity of blood in your oxygen. Uh, sorry, higher capacity of oxygen in your blood. Because of that exercise, your lymph system will be working well. Toxins removed from your body. Would you be okay with flushing your toilet once a week? I knew I'd get a smile from some of you. <laughs> if you do not exercise, you are not flushing your toilet. Because exercise flushes your body and is healing for you. Even your major organs are stimulated by when you're running or playing soccer or cycling or swimming or whatever exercise you do. But you must pant and sweat. 
Clean the pores of your body. Get your mind cleared out. Exercise, your body thrives on it. Young people, I'm telling you that today there's going to be lots of good intentions leaving the room. Very, very few will apply all these things. But I'm telling you, do these things. Even if it's a one kilometer jog that you do and back again and it's only five minutes, it is better than nothing. Flush your bodies out. And for me, I do it in the afternoons or evenings when I come back from work. And I'm telling you, when I sit at home and I think the last thing I want to do is go jogging. That is now a sign to me. When I don't want to go, that is a sign I must go. And I've set myself to achieve 20 kilometers that I run every week. Every week I must do 20 kilometers. I can do more, maybe a few less, but I must always be more than that. As a goal, just to say this is good for me. Because I come home from work and I think I can't do this. I go jogging and the moment I've finished my run, I can tell you I know I've done the right thing. I feel good in my body. I feel completely de-stressed from sitting in front of the computer or in that meeting or whatever it is, completely de-stressed. Thirdly, in my mind, I feel good about myself. I feel good about myself. And it's got nothing to do with the fourth point, which is the endorphins that we have, that as we're running, they're natural stimulants to make you feel good. Have you learned something? Guys, exercise is so important. 20 minutes, three times a week, pant and sweat. Don't care what anybody thinks about how you look. Pant and sweat. And then go home and shower or bath or do what you need to do. Exercise. The second is nutrition. Guys, eat wisely. Eat well. Eat a variety of things. I love to travel because I think when I'm traveling, I'm getting other nutrition that might be a little bit sparse in Zambia. Zambia is short of zinc. It's short of boron. So let me tell you, if you can eat nuts, add different fruit to your diet, it makes a difference. Here's the thing. Everything that you are physically, everything that you think, your very being, comes from one thing. It comes from your stomach and the food that you eat. Have you ever thought about that? If you do wrong by your stomach, you are limiting your whole being. Some children who are malnourished will not achieve their mental capacity. Let's extrapolate that. You and I will be our best when we're getting all the nutrition that we need. And we don't get that from eating just three kinds of food. Don't eat too much carbohydrate. What is the most common carbohydrate in Zambia? Guys, eat less of it. And when you eat it, make sure it's the roller meal and not the super refined, which is just a lovely status symbol and it's bad for you because it's almost pure starch. Any of the good things have been taken out of it. Do yourself a favor, save some money, buy roller meal and let people laugh at you. It is better for you and it is much happier on your pocket. I think, I've never, I mean, I don't buy roller meal or Nishima, so I don't know. It's not my space in my life, but I believe that that is true, isn't it? Guys, do yourselves a favor, but more importantly, vegetables, fruit, nuts. Please don't say, I don't like the taste of it. Every morning, I eat fresh turmeric and fresh ginger, which comes from my garden. I eat a lemon, I eat the lemon peel. I've got soft lemons in my garden, so they're easy to chew. But I eat a bit of the skin, I eat the fruit, I drink the juice every day. Do I like the taste? It's not about the taste. Taste is something when I go to the evening and I drink a nice glass of wine with a beautiful meal, then by all means choose what you want. But I know that I need something like turmeric. It's an anti-inflammatory and I do a lot of exercise. Ginger, go and read up. Just Google ginger, turmeric, lemon juice. As you get older, maybe you'll appreciate it more. <laughs> but guys, at my age, I'm very thankful to the Lord. On Tomorrow morning, I'll be doing a 75-kilometer bicycle ride. And it won't be a difficult thing for me. Will you be able to do that when you're my age? And it's not about me, guys. It's not about me doing sport. It's not about that. It's about, are you investing in your future correctly today? Because today the decisions count. Eat well. A little warning about the vegetables. Don't buy cheap. In fact, don't buy cheap food. Buy good quality food. Because it's everything that you are. It's all your body's got to work with. 
and be careful of cheap vegetables because if they're cheap, they're cheap for a reason. They don't care what chemicals they're spraying on to make sure the insects and the fungus are not on them. Be very careful where you're buying your vegetables from because if there's residual chemical on there, that's not good for you. And I worry about that in, in Zambia. I worry so much that people who are employed at Precision, we gift them fresh vegetables every second week that have no chemicals or, or, or certainly the chemicals that are sprayed are managed carefully with the correct harvest intervals so that I can know that our team are getting good quality food. Invest in the food that you eat. Exercise, nutrition, what do you think the third point is? Any guesses? Sorry? Ha, you should come up here and ta tag, tag team with me. Sleep. Guys, sleep is so important. Seven to eight hours, you don't need 24 hours of sleep, in case some of you are thinking along that line. But whatever works for you, if it's eight, seven hours, make sure that you program in your sleep. Now, you can short-circuit it for exam time for a few days. But on the whole, get your sleep. And if you exercise well, you will sleep well. Guard that space. Because it is a place that we still don't fully understand how it rejuvenates us how it allows us to process thoughts, how it works through emotions, and you will be a much happier, healthier camper if you've had your sleep. You'll be much more productive, you'll be much more effective in your retention and passing on of information. It's so easy, just make sure you do it. Right, we've talked about investing. Investing in a healthy lifestyle. We've talked about Relationships, we've talked about the physical space, the spiritual space, and now I want to quickly challenge you about investing in yourself. Three points, education, accountability, and self-motivation. Education, accountability, and self-motivation. When I talk about investing in education, I'm not talking about going to a university or a college. I am talking about investing in your attitude to learning. Open up your mind to know about the blueberries and the avocados. Open up your mind about what China is doing to restrict and control its people. Open your mind about how is the tar road outside paid for. Open your mind to, to how is South Africa quietly on one day said no more masks, no more COVID restrictions, no more nothing and just quietly done the gazette and the only way it gets out into the open spectrum is because the news headlines just go crazy that from yesterday to today we are free of all these restrictions and all I can say is Lord I hope all of SADC takes on the same approach open your mind read do you know that we can have BBC news on FM here in your car free of charge you've got the internet you've got newspapers You've got Al Jazeera on, on DSTV on a very, very low bouquet. Just watch and see. Put on your filters. Recognize who's telling you the story. Listen. But understand, what's happening in Israel? What's happening in, in Russia? How is that affecting? How is that affecting your cooking oil price? Isn't that interesting? Open up your minds. Be ready to learn. Not because you have to, but because you want to. We're not talking an expensive education. We're talking rather a strong foundation in the art of learning, desiring to learn new things. Start now if you're not already in that space. And if you're already in that space, increase your learning. It doesn't matter if it's a topic that you think is not of interest to you or not immediately of benefit to you. Just take some notes. It changes your worldview. Secondly, accountability. I can't tell you how important is accountability. Have you heard any of these statements amongst your friends, in the headlines, or anywhere in the community around you? The government should fix this. It's the council's fault. These politicians need to do something. I am not the one. They are the one. They should have done this. You know, it's all up to them. It's their fault. Are any of these familiar to you? The world is saying it's not my problem. It's somebody else's problem and you, young people, 
be different. Make it your problem. Make it your issue. Do not judge others. You get up and make a difference. Do not blame others for the problem. If you do not go and vote in the election, you have a right to complain. No, you don't. If you don't go and vote in the election, you have no right to complain about who's in power. And you have no right to complain when the electricity gets cut off. But if you do go and vote, I think you do have a right to complain. But complain in a way that makes a difference. Go and find the MP, your local MP. Go and tell them, you're accountable. You've taken this position. Do something about it. But don't sit and whine on social media. Don't sit and whine. Because actually it's not pleasant for your friends to listen to. You be different. Practice self-reliance. Guys, if you're going to set up a business, you have to do the grunge work. You have to do the hard work to start off with until you can afford somebody else to pay. You have to sweep the floor until you can pay somebody to come and sweep the floor and make the coffee. Practice self-reliance. It's not the government's problem. It's not the council's problem. It's not somebody else's problem. Make it your problem. And you become an agent of change. And you be nice to live around because you don't complain. You just say, wow, you listen, and then you get on and you do it. And people see from your actions that you are different. Wouldn't you want to be that kind of person? Wouldn't you want to be around that kind of person? Education, accountability, self-motivation. Self-motivation is critical. There's nobody to get you out of bed in the morning if you don't want to. I uh, sometimes get a little bit of insight into these uh, reality TV shows from America. And sometimes I'm amazed that some of these people seem to struggle to get out of bed in the morning. And you know, it's somebody else's fault. It's their mum or dad who caused them to be there. Or it's, and I just think, really? Those are not the principles by which God has established life. He's given you gifts and skills and talents and abilities. Get out there and use them. You be self-motivated for the glory of God and for the betterment of yourself. The best way to learn that is to be a servant leader and start your own business. And when you can't pay for the guy to do the job, you do it yourself. And you know what? Sometimes when you can pay the guy to do the job or the lady to do the job, you go and do it yourself anyway. I'll tell you this lovely story about my aunt who had a bed and breakfast in a big city in South Africa. And she said this executive arrived to stay there for three or four days. And she didn't really know who he was, a black South African. And he came there and he was very humble and polite and he did his business. And at the end of it, he was leaving and he said, please, can I have a hose pipe? Why do you want a hose pipe? Because I want to wash my hired car. She found out that he was one of the highest paid executives at the very top of his industry in South Africa. His story was interesting because he started as a sweeper and he ended up being this high level executive industry influencer. And here he is in his shorts without his shoes washing his hired car. Now when you hire a car, You've paid for it to be cleaned when you just drop it off. And I do that. I use the car, then I drop it, and they must take care of it because that's what you've paid for. He showed not just an action but an attitude that said, I want to return this car as clean as when I received it from somebody who could have paid anybody to do it. And I really regard that as a testimony to servant leadership worth remembering. Education, invest in yourself. Accountability, invest in yourself. Self-motivation, invest in yourself. Lastly, invest wisely in assets. Listen carefully. Spend less than you earn. Guys, I don't know if you know how deep that is. Spend less than you earn. Take 10%, the first 10%, the first fruit, and give it to the Lord. Save some more, and then spend the rest. I can't tell you how life-changing that will be if you just follow that advice. But it'll be tough. It'll be very tough. Here's a conundrum for you. Do you know what a conundrum is? Anybody know what a conundrum is? Sorry? A? A problem. A puzzle. Yes, that's it. 
a problem, a puzzle, something that's difficult to understand. I'm going to tell you a conundrum. An employee who's doing so well and everything's fine and, and they could do with a little bit more money. But they're fine. And they get a 25% increase in salary. I mean, that's mind-blowing. That'll make them happy for the rest of their days, won't it? Do you know they're overjoyed for the first three months? And then something amazing happens. Four months, five months. Do you know that the income's not enough anymore and they need a little bit more income? Did you know that? And I see it amongst our team members. Because suddenly, oh, I can afford this and I can afford that. And they've forgotten, spend less than you earn. And some of those people will even come and say they need a loan. Well, they don't anymore because they're going to get kicked out the office. <laughs> because spend less than you earn. Now, I'm going to tell you the other part of the secret, which is absolutely critical, is invest what you save. And I'm just going to quickly give you a picture. You save a little bit of money every month. And as soon as you can, and this is just one way of doing it, is you buy a one-roomed house in the cheapest compound. You buy that and you start renting it out for 500 kwacha. Why is that important? Do you know the difference between active and passive income? Anybody want to give me a difference between active and passive? Yeah? You're getting all the questions answered in this corner. So active income would be you working for the money, so on a job. And passive income would be something that doesn't need your frequent attention. Very good. In the first instance, you're working for your money. In the second, your money's working for you. Excellent. That 500 kwacha is ticking. When you're sleeping at night, it's ticking. When you go on holiday, it's ticking. When you're sick, it's ticking. Active, when you're selling your time, if you're sick, you don't get paid unless you're on a nice job where you get paid. But if it's your own job, whatever, you don't get money while you're sick. So the more you can put into that passive investment, the better for you. Once you've got that one bedroom house, the rent's going, suddenly you take that rent, save it and buy a second one bedroom house. Don't buy a house that you need to live in. Buy a house that you can rent out in an area where you know people need housing. And the third house, so that as soon as you can, you are living in your own house and you have four other houses that in theory, you can stop working by selling your time. I'm just putting that out there as a model. Guys, if you do this and you keep your income expense ratio low, you, your expenses are low, you will do yourself a great favor. Because many other people who go through life spending too much, not tithing, not careful with their money, and you get very surprised when they're in their 40s and their 50s and they still owe money and they don't own their own house. And Don't be like that. You be different. And let me tell you, the best time to start is today. Because, God willing, you have many years ahead of you. And as those years multiply, your investment multiplies. If you can follow the rational, rationale of what I'm saying, you're, you're good. I'm not going to go into any more detail. But you dwell on that. Guys, I've been talking for quite a long time. And I've covered uh, a part of what I wanted to say. I, I'm happy to talk a little bit about what a good interview looks like. Um, and getting a job. But I'm also happy just to wrap up with regards to the pastor as a career. What's the call? Would you like me to keep going or shall I, shall I wrap up now? Are you sure? We're all good. Okay, cool. If you're employable, then going for a job. And, and remember that this is not just about getting a job. This principles here will also apply to you looking to employ people into your business, hopefully one day. But first of all, preparation before you go to a business to have an interview do your preparation well it makes such a difference what kind of preparation could you do before you go for an interview at precision farming for example good i have sent people away without even bothering to interview them because they arrived late Amen. <laughs> but let's just go into the wisdom of that. 
Ah, but I struggled to find where the company was because I thought it was somewhere else. Hello, take stress off yourself. Do you want to arrive at an interview stressed because you were struggling to find it? Or because you got stuck in traffic? Is that at your best? It isn't at your best. Let's spin it around. Arrive half an hour early. Arrive half an hour early. I'm getting ahead of myself. Arrive half an hour early and to walk around. Meet the people. Hello, who are you? What's your role in the company? Oh, wow. What's this company like to work for? Imagine. Imagine. You can pick up so much information. And you're cool, calm, and collected. Hey, so that's the guys interviewing me. Ah, oh, okay. Jeez, that's the lady who's in charge here. Yes, I can hear her shouting from here. Yee. Cool. Okay, no, but she's, she shouts like that, and then five minutes later, she's fine. Ah, cool. Okay, nice. Yeah. Whatever. Pick up the information. Do yourself a favor. Be on time. What other ways can you prepare for your interview? Sorry? The way you dress. Excellent. Very good. Research the company. Know everything you can about the company. Dress well. Be on time. I'm going to tell you a few other important things. Your CV that you will have submitted must be perfect. <laughs> Is it possible to be perfect? It's not possible to be perfect, but I'm telling you this. Your CV must be perfect. <laughs> I hardly read CVs. I'll flick through, and I don't know what it is, but I can just pick up syntax errors like this. I can pick up bad sentence structure. I can pick up, and I just look at it and I say, really? It's just not a good starting point, and a good person could be rejected on that basis. Get the CV right. Perfect. Guys, polish up your Microsoft Office skills. Just listen to me. Polish up your Microsoft Office skills. Microsoft Office, Excel, Word, maybe PowerPoint, in that order. Excel, you must be backwards and forwards on that. Word, very important, so that you can write and, and be able to do documents well. And then PowerPoint presentations, if you have to do that kind of space, be ready for that. I don't know how to use PowerPoint. I don't need to anymore. I'll get somebody else to do it. But that is a space that you may be, because you may be going for a teaching role. And PowerPoint may be crucial for your role. So research the company, know what's involved, and make sure you prepare for it. Don't short it. Your holidays, your spare time, you should be on Excel. Know how to do an invoice. What goes on to an invoice? The date, product, how many units, times by the price. Calculate that across this way. You must have a formula that calculates across. Put five of them in. Then you must have a nice sum up, and it must be an easy sum up. You must know how to copy and paste. You must be able to sort products. You must be able to take one sheet and make a complete replica of it, which is different to copying and pasting. You must know how to do a budget. You must know how to put the quatcha sign in front of a number and the computer sees it as a number and not a word so it can add it up. You must know those things. Don't bother going to a serious company without knowing those things. Just do it. And you know what? It will be useful for you, even if the company never uses that skill from you. I'm telling you that Excel is such a powerful tool. I've seen it used for so many things, and in my personal life, I've used it extensively. If you're going to start your own business, if you're going to work for a boss, if you're going to have a contract, you make sure you write it up, draft it out, whatever, but be ready with these skills. Know how to use Gmail. Know how to use browsers. Know how to use whatever packages they might be employing you for. Know what salary expectation you have. Know the cost it's going to take for you to get to work, get back. What are the other things that are in the contract? Don't start a, a job seriously without having a contract in place. Now, I believe somebody could come and work for our company without a contract because we agree and we've got integrity and we do what we say we're going to do. But in principle, a contract makes sure there's no misunderstandings. And too many have been the people that I know who have started a job and Six months, a year later, they're saying, I haven't been paid my bonus that was promised me. What did your contract say? Mm. Oh, we haven't signed the contract. Really? Within a week, you need to be able to, and I know it's tough. You've been offered this job. You don't want to leave the job. But excuse me, sir. Excuse me, madam. We, we agreed these things. Can we have a contract, please? Or can I write up the contract and we both sign it? And it just needs to be a little summary, bullet points, and agree. Do yourselves a favor, make sure you get it tied up.
That's the preparation before you get there. Then you get to the interview. We've talked about presentation. We've talked about timing. The way you dress is important. Here's a little one. Body odor and your breath. <laughs> Guys, just don't let it happen. We've had people waft into the office with bad body odor and it's just unpleasant. <laughs> and it is just not the way to go. Because if you're being interviewed by three people and two of them are going to be sitting in the same office with you, what do they think? What do they think about your personal hygiene straight away? Don't do it. Which is also why you should be on time. Because you want to arrive fresh and relaxed. Don't do it. Make sure you've got a... Here's a secret. Promise not to tell anybody. Do you see these? That is one of the cheapest sweets you can get. But man, it's got the kick of hang in terms of its peppermint flavor. And this will cleanse your breath for at least half an hour. But don't go into the interview with one of these. Suck it, put it back in your pocket, swallow it, spit it out, whatever you have to do. But get these things right. Because they're little things, but they can make a massive difference. Here's another one. Smile. Glow. Let, let the light shine. I know you're nervous. You may be nervous. Maybe you're not. Communicate well. Communication is so important. Underline this. I can see you all taking notes. Talk slowly and clearly. It does two things. It allows people, you speak very well. It allows people, firstly, to hear what you're saying so they're not embarrassed or uncomfortable by repeatedly having to ask you, what did you say? Secondly, you give yourself a chance to think about what you're going to say. Now, I am talking really slowly, and I've got your attention. It's not a bad thing to talk slowly or with emphasis. So almost you could imagine yourself on a bit of a stage and, and maybe before you go for your interviews, get in front of a mirror and talk to yourself. Practice what you're going to say because they're likely to say to you, well, what are you good at or, or, or who are you? Practice what you're going to say in front of the mirror. Watch what you look like. Listen to how you mm -hmm. sound like and then give it a go. Don't talk too much. <laughs> If it's a two-minute answer, give them a two-minute answer. Not a 15-minute waffle. That just irritates me because my time is valuable. And it doesn't impress anybody. You know, the bubbles on my beer, I can toss them, I can soak them up, but they don't give much flavor. Don't be that bubbly kind of a person. Just sensible, quick answers. Do paint clear pictures. And this is, for me, an important part of communication. I wish I had more time with you because I could do a whole discussion on just communicating well. But when you speak, make sure you're giving a full picture. A very good example was I got very frustrated with one of our drivers the other day. Walks into my office and says, I've uh, taken it and they changed the brakes. <laughs> Stop, start again. So this is where I had to be patient because we took probably 15 minutes. But by the time we'd finished, I made him say out the full sentence how he should have said it in the beginning. <laughs> and, and the good story is that he left glowing with pride because I congratulated him on, on his success because he had moved from one to the other. It just took us some time to get there. But the final point was I took the vehicle back 1884 registration number to... Action Auto, and I met Martin there, and I showed him the vehicle, and they had a look. They recognized that there was some issue with the belts which needed tightening, and those belts were tightened. Nothing else needed to be done, and I brought the vehicle back, and it's working nicely. <laughs> Is that not a significantly clear picture compared to the first statement? <laughs> Guys, paint the picture well, but do it concisely. Do it concisely, meaning not using lots of words. And that takes a bit of practice, but it's worth persevering with. Get your contract signed, the company's obligations, and your obligations. Very clear. Make sure those are out and clear. That's the interview process. If you're finished with the interview, 
They say, welcome to our company. We're so excited to have you. And you arrive with enthusiasm. Have any of you ever started a new job before? Some of you. Isn't, isn't, isn't the arriving great? Mostly. It's nerve-wracking, but it's exciting. You're there. You've been chosen. You're the chosen one. You saw there were 15 other CVs. You're the one, and you're there, and it's exciting. That's great. The way you arrive should be the same way that you leave the company. Okay, I'm going to let that simmer and stew. Firstly, your work ethic is critical. Certainly for me, precision farming, we're looking for character and integrity. The work ethic is important. Be passionate and happy. Be passionate and happy. That doesn't mean we put a false smile on our lips the whole day. But be a happy person, not a complaining person. Don't complain. Yes, there's a time when something's not right. By all means, address it. By all means, speak about it. By all means, take it up with the right person. But don't be a complainer. Nobody likes to be around that kind of person. But they love to be around the kind of person who's smiling and connecting. Don't, what we call skinner, chattering about other people behind their backs. Do you know that word skinner? It's a lovely word, skinner. What happens when I talk to this person about that person and that person about that person? Don't be one of those. Firstly, as a believer, you shouldn't be in that space. Secondly, you do yourself a disfavor. You really do. If you become known as that kind of person, your mates, your workmates will not be on your side. Do more than is expected of you. You do 110%. Don't stand back saying somebody else needs to do that. Just walk in there and do it. You pick up the responsibility. Make yourself indispensable. Nobody's indispensable, but you make yourself indispensable. Don't stand back and say, it's not my job. Oh, I'm too tired. Mm, I need to leave work early. You get in there and you do what needs to be done. And I'm not suggesting you work all hours of the day and night. Slave labor. I'm not suggesting that. Every task is a chance to learn. That should be your attitude. I've never swept this office before. Well, you go ahead and you do the best possible job you can until that is slicker than the guy who does it himself. Or the lady who does it. It's not what you can't do. It's what you can do. Think outside of the box. Systemic thinking. Can I tell you a little story about... Have we got time for a story? We haven't got time for a story. It's too late, sorry. Um, don't take lots of time off from the company. Make sure that you do your work. Of course, if you need to take leave, take leave. That's fine. But don't be a slacker. Guys, don't steal. Don't steal anything. Don't steal time and don't steal energy. Don't steal time and don't steal energy. I think it is unfair to spend Sunday night watching soccer until 3 in the morning and then going to the office the next morning and expecting to give it your 100%. That's stealing time. Unless you know you can manage that space because you've been resting extra to make up for it, don't steal time or energy from the company. Your reputation takes time to build, and it can be destroyed in a second like a house of cards. Guys, this is important. Relationships. Respect everybody. Respect the coffee maker, the sweeper, the boss, the CEO, the person who sits next to you. Respect them all. Be friends with all, even the unimportant people. Remember the networking I talked to you about. Don't tolerate compromise. You will have people around you saying, no, it's okay. Yes, you can do this. It's okay to spin 100 copies through the photocopier for your own use. Don't do it. Be absolutely honest no matter what the cost and do not be afraid to stand up and be different. Do not be afraid. Serve others. Be the servant leader. Guys, then leaving the job. You arrived well, leave well. Serve your notice period. If you can, discuss with your boss why you're leaving. Excuse me, madam. I'm so unhappy here. I just think I'm a bad fit. Release me. Maybe they can look at it and understand and maybe change circumstances. But if they really need to release you, it's fine. You've asked. Leave well. Serve the time of your contract and give your notice period. And I will tell you now, there are people who have done the dirty on precision farming and they've left without notice period or with short notice period. There are people who are left not telling the truth. 
Later they come back and they say, please, can you help? I need a reference or I need help with or I need... <laughs> I want to tell you the good stories. There are a number of people who have left Precision who have sat down and planned their exit. One lady in particular took a year to leave Precision Farming. We worked together and I just want to tell you that was one of the best relationships. She can get a job here tomorrow. No problem. Because we talked it through, she helped train up somebody. When she was ready to leave, she said, I think I'm ready now. We said, okay, I, we think you're ready now. And when we left, we, we parted ways a year later. Another good story is people who have left well to say, Ken, we don't feel we've got the best opportunity here. We've got this other thing going on. Can we go? We are now doing business with employees who have left Precision well. Because we've got a good relationship, they talked about it, we planned for it, they trained somebody to take over, and then we parted ways. And we shortened the notice period where we could. I've even negotiated with a future employer to say, please, we need this person for another five days. We'll pay them, we'll take care of it. Can you live without them for another five days? Yes, we can. Thank you very much. They've stayed on longer. Is that out of the box? You guys be different. Arrive well and leave well because you never know when the people in that company will cross paths with you again especially if you stay within one industry not just your contract but the spirit of the law guys i've covered a lot of ground and i recognize that the question we came to discuss today was was work opportunities occupations in that agricultural space i wanted to challenge you about the big world out there, getting out of the box and thinking, being different. And it starts with you. It starts with the quality of you inside you and your attitude. The circumstances will be the same whether you complain or whether you get up and say, I'm going to be the agent of change. The circumstances are still the same, but you choose your attitude. Have I met the expectations that you raise coming here today?